Well, good afternoon, everyone. I have one o'clock Eastern, so we will get started today. Welcome to another week of Superior Health COVID-19 Nursing Home Leadership Roundtable discussion. My name is Kelsey Ostergren, and I am joined by my program co-leads, Jerry Hineker and Kim Haft. And today is actually the first session in our new format. So I just wanted to take a minute to kind of recap what this will look like moving forward, since we've had a bit of transition um, and I see some new folks, I see some folks that have been with us in the past, so just kind of wanted to take a moment to talk about that. So the first 30 minutes is still gonna be our traditional education. That's what this call has always been. Uh, the next 30 minutes then will really shift into more of an open Q&A session. Um, we recognize that in the past, we've really been running out of time to address some of the questions that we've been getting. And we just want to make this, it's your time. We want it to be interactive. And so we hope that by changing the format a little bit, that this will give you that opportunity to engage with one another, to ask questions of our team at Superior Health, and just kind of have a discussion about whatever is on your mind. And, you know, this, as I mentioned, is really your time to get feedback and support from your peers on anything COVID related. We want you to feel like you have a community with your peers as well as with our Superior Health team. So we will start that Q&A with a discussion about the topic that's presented, um, but this is also an opportunity for you to ask any other COVID-related questions, even if they're not related to whatever our education topic is for the day. As always, our slides will be available and we will have a link to the evaluation at the end of the session, which we would appreciate your feedback on as well. So with all of that said, uh, today we are joined by Dr. Redwood, an emergency and preventive medicine physician, um, who's gonna talk about strategies on avoiding the ED with COVID-19. And then following his presentation, the Q&A session that we touched on um, will be moderated by Kristen Bosch. So before I turn it over to Dr. Redwood, just a couple other additional reminders. Uh, so we are still looking for resident or family members who want to share their story about why they chose to get vaccinated. Um, Tony Kettner is the point of contact from our team who's really leading this. So if you have someone in mind, um, we would love to highlight them, highlight your facility. Please just reach out to her or to any one of us on this call. And we're happy to connect you with her. Um, and then just a reminder here, the deadline for this is just over two weeks away. It will be April 28th. Um, so again, just I'd encourage you to think about it. If you have someone or a few someones that you think um, would be a good candidate for this, please let us know. And another reminder on the CMS scenario-based training modules. Um, these are, again, available on demand at no cost to all of our nursing home staff. Uh, CMS is monitoring which nursing homes have had 75% of their staff complete this training. So we are strongly encouraging folks to consider a mechanism to disseminate and get their staff to participate in this. I know last week I mentioned that there is also an option to complete this training in a group setting. Um, and there are instructions here on the slide um, for how you can go about that. So once you get the slide deck, feel free, take a peek at that. See if this is something that you might, you know, figure out a way to get folks together to go through the content, talk about it, maybe even a journal club or a, you know, group discussion, any creative way that you can kind of bring this content to your team, get them through that um, and just foster that environment of education, I think will be really powerful. As always, our team is here to help you. Um, Christy Wergeen's contact information is at the bottom of the slide. So she's our point person for this, but feel free if you have any contact for anybody at Superior Health, including our team that's on the call today, we are all more than happy to help you um, just reach out and let us know what we can do, um, you know, to be of assistance. So I threw a lot at you, long laundry list of housekeeping announcements for today. Um, but with that, Dr. Redwood, welcome. We are so glad to have you with us and are really looking forward to hearing the content you've prepared for us today. Thank you so much, Kelsey. I am likewise excited to be here. I was telling Kelsey before the presentation started that um, this is actually an atypical audience for me. So I haven't had a lot of opportunities to present to um, long-term care facility leadership, and I'm pretty excited about it. 
I think of ourselves as kindred spirits. So um, we are both 24 seven, our patient populations skew elderly, they skew medically complex. Um, and I'm sure uh, every, every shift brings a lot of um, excitement and opportunities and challenges to provide patient care and problem solve. Um, and really we've both been hit pretty hard by COVID-19 and the pandemic in terms of um, patient morbidity and mortality, in terms of staffing and just overall logistics, um, infection control nightmares, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I think we probably have a lot to learn from each other. And honestly, I think the most enriching part of this conversation will probably be the question and answers at the end. So as I go through things, please feel free to jot stuff down or if there's anything idea generating, this is really a great opportunity to have a discussion between long-term care facilities and the emergency departments. And our worlds overlap so much, but we so rarely communicate because the nature of the ED is often kind of a one-off. We don't form deep relationships with patients. We, you know, we assess and stabilize, um, treat emergent medical conditions and, and discharge home when there is none. And we don't have a lot of follow-up. So as an emergency physician, that's something I'm always hungry for is follow-up. And I'd love to hear um, your perspectives on any of the points that we hit on today. Next slide, please. Now, I'm a, I'm a unique breed, I like to think, as a, a dual-trained preventive medicine physician and emergency medicine physician. Um, so my personal tagline is that every emergency is a failure of prevention. And the pandemic has really synthesized these two worlds that I work in in a, in a pretty significant way. Um, so my day job is I run an emergency department. I'm at Cooley Dickinson Hospital. I'm the chief of emergency medicine, and we have about 100 patients a day, 36,000 visits a year. Um, so it's a, it's a mid-sized city, busy emergency department, and um, we have definitely been significantly strained during the pandemic. Uh, and then when I go home, I go to my laptop, and I'm looking at the latest COVID case numbers, I'm looking at the newest variants, um, what therapies are in the pipelines, and really thinking about how we can keep people out of the emergency department when possible. Um, you've, you've probably all realized this, but I don't think the goal of this pandemic is no disease. You know, we're, that, that ship has sailed and that ship was probably never even realistic, but it's about mitigating illness, mitigating the spikes, and trying to slow down the severe cases to the point that our hospitals and health systems don't get overwhelmed so we can provide care for those who really do get into trouble with COVID. Um, so the goals of this presentation will be to talk about that, how to mitigate morbidity and mortality and hopefully avoid the ED for your residents. Um, and then I kind of lift the veil a little bit and talk about our everyday workflow, what happens in the ED. So we will be talking about evidence-based uh, therapies to mitigate COVID-19. Um, we'll talk about usual ED care for COVID-19 and then explain kind of who gets admitted to the hospital and who goes home with a watch and wait strategy. Um, Obviously, I think it's outside of the scope to talk about comprehensive COVID-19 care. That's probably an entire, you know, multi-day conference. Um, and then we'll be presenting some therapies today, but I don't really want to go into a deep dive on every single therapy, the side effects, the contraindications. I think that would be yawn-inducing, um, but I did want you to have the slides as a reference. So if you're talking with your medical director or your pharmacy, or you're wondering what you can get on formulary, you have sort of a you know, an evidence-based reference to go to on the most up-to-date therapies for COVID-19. Um, and then I certainly don't want to pretend that I understand the nuances of COVID-19 in the long-term care settings. In fact, I'm very interested what those nuances are. So if anyone hears something and wants to share a perspective or educate me on COVID-19 in long-term care facilities, um, I would just find that fascinating and welcome it. So next slide. Now, this is probably old hat. You are all... Um, uh, infection control experts at this time, but I, I heard this one term, I think I heard it on the New York Times, that it's called the hammer and the dance, and it's the approach to um, a pandemic, essentially, when you have these waves of illness, and the hammer is the idea of we have all these public health tools, and sometimes you really have to bring down the hammer and use them all at once. That's what we did during, you know, the initial wave in March 2020, that's what we did during Delta, that's what we did during Omicron. And then the dance is lightly letting up. So letting up of certain interventions so that the public doesn't get, or, or your residents for that matter, don't get so um, sick of all of the interventions that they lose power, that they say, we're not gonna do this anymore, that they reject and rebel against conventional public health wisdom. And so this list here is really kind of a, a buffet of what, what you do and what you can do when you're having an outbreak. And um, you know it's interesting right now, we're in, in the midst of the BA2 variant. And people are calling it the silent variant or the silent um, 
epidemic. Um, we are now 85%. If you look at the CDC proportion map, we are 85% BA2. Um, and it's not coming to hospital, not coming to inpatient hospital largely, but certainly coming to the ED. So we've seen a big uptake in ED utilization from the BA2 variant. Um, and a lot of just kind of surprise positive tests where you, you're testing someone for some other reason, a procedure, and they, they end up testing positive. So um, there's a lot of low-level illness there. Uh, it's interesting. Is this going to be our gateway into endemic land, or, um, or are we going to see this um, continue to spike and just by sheer numbers see more hospitalizations? Time will obviously tell. But it brings us to our first point. Um, something I do on a daily basis is, is check our percent positivity um, and other key metrics, including deaths and hospitalizations. In my experience, the hospital data is about one week ahead of the public health data. Um, we are obviously a funnel where all the sickest people in the Tri-County area come to one building. And so um, we, see, we see the positivity rate go up sooner. So if, if I see my hospital positivity rate for week one is 9%, I can um, presume that it's going to be about 3% in the community the, the following week. So we get a little bit of an early lead time on those numbers, which is helpful. It's helpful for messaging out to our community partners and setting expectations in terms of how much capacity we'll have. Um, and, you know, there's no set number. Every public health department is going to choose a, a different number. But when we're less than 1%, that's when we tend to lighten up in terms of community interventions like physical distancing and avoiding large crowd, even masking now. Um, and when it's around 2% is when we start to clamp down a little bit and try to, uh, try to smooth out that curve so our hospitals don't get overwhelmed. Uh, the interventions, again, you know all this, but N95s are better than surgical masks, are better than cloth masks. Double masking is better than all of those. Um, if you're in high risk settings like a healthcare environment, there's no, no reason not to wear face shields or eye protection, um, although they obviously fog up and we get our, we get our nose um, skin breakdown and all of those things. So you have to think of your employees and their wellness as well. The fomite risk is actually relatively low. I think it was quite overstated in March 2020, um, not without good intention, of course, but um, we find that the fomite risk is much lower than thought. Um, so wiping down services, hand hygiene are obviously fundamental for infection prevention in general, um, but the fomites aren't surviving for days like we originally thought, and um, I don't think people are washing their groceries anymore or leaving them outside overnight. Um, and then uh, testing and contract, uh, contact tracing is obviously um, per institution and availability of testing. Contact tracing made a little more sense when we were trying to actually prevent an outbreak um, with, the, with the amount of transmission that we're seeing now. I haven't seen a lot of, of earnest contact tracing going on unless there's a specific reason to. Um, and then I'm assuming you've thought very, very hard and long about your physical plant innovations. Everything's from HEPA filters and national airflow, moving people outside to barrier and sneeze guards and cohorting patients into sick and not sick sections uh, as appropriate. So, so that's, that's sort of the, the menu of items for the hammer and the dance. And I think the, um, in our business, emergency department and long-term care facilities, it's anticipating when are we going to have to bring down the hammer and really ramp up these infection control um, interventions, and when can we loosen up a little bit? I know in our emergency department, we now have two visitors allowed. Um, throughout Omicron, we had no visitors allowed, and in the in-between area, we had one visitor allowed. Um, and so we, we have sort of a dial that we can turn up or down depending on our needs. Next slide. Again, I'm preaching to the choir here, but vaccinate early and boost often. They just approved a second booster for um, folks older than age 50, which I think is wonderful. We want to establish immunity and then really maintain immunity. Um, and we know it's going to naturally wane and this will probably become a biannual or annual phenomena where we get our COVID boosters, time will tell. Um, the literature sh is showing that mixing um, vaccinations is, is in general better than single stream. Uh, that doesn't mean if you got all Pfizer, that's wrong. I got all Pfizer, you know, my wife got all Moderna. Um, but if you do have an opportunity to mix, that is um, an opportunity you shouldn't miss. Um, most EDs have started vaccinating people. It's not like we want people to come to the ED specifically to get vaccinated. That would be a poor use of, of um, a precious resource. However, the hospitals often have a vial open and you don't wanna waste any of this very precious resource either. Um, and then we have certain patient populations who you, the ED might be your only time to see this population. For example, um, 
you know, I'm right by an interstate. We get truckers coming through. We have a houseless population. We are a tourist destination. We have people visiting from out of country. Um, and so if, if we see an opportunity to vaccinate someone who may have not otherwise been vaccinated, we will seize that opportunity. Um, but then we, we don't message out to the broader community to send people to ED for vaccines just because of capacity reasons. Um, and then hybrid immunity is a plus. So if unfortunately you did become ill with Omicron, for example, or now BA2, um, you should get some degree of additional immunity from that. Um, but if anyone mentions as they were, I think it was about six weeks ago, that we should be intentionally getting sick or contracting COVID-19 for hybrid immunity, no. It's not that good. Um, it's it's really marginal, and that uh, idea is ludicrous. So, but it's good to say these things out loud because you hear it on the news or or see a little something on your Twitter feed, and it's important that we um, that we speak in truth and evidence based medicine instead of um, whatever the latest um, you know the latest disinformation out there is. Next slide. I'm gonna burn through the pharmaceutical strategies to prevent COVID-19. Again, my intention here is for you to have this slide deck. So if you're talking with your medical director or you're talking with your pharmacist or something fell, falls off formulary and you have to go to your next go-to, you have an idea of what where to go next. Um, I wasn't able to find the information for Minnesota, but I did see a heat map um, from Wisconsin, from the Department of Health Services about where um, these COVID-19 therapies are available. And it's really throughout the entire state. I mean, I remember looking a couple of weeks ago and it was quite sparse um, and now it is, is really blanketing the state. So these are widely available. There was a period where they were not and we were talking about judicious use and um, sort of risk stratifying patients and putting in different tiers of need. And that, that era has by and large ended and these therapies are readily available. Um, the, the real question now is where do you get these therapies? Where, what is the best environment to give them? Um, and that is very system dependent. So I think you'll put, get a different answer, you know, 50 different hospitals, you'll get 50 different answers. Um, and I have no uh, disclosures with any of these pharmaceutical companies. These are all just, uh, you know, kind of coming out as they come out. So um, Evushield is the only uh, pharmaceutical strategy to actually prevent COVID-19. So this is a double monoclonal antibody injection. They're IM injections, single dose. And the idea with Evushield is um, if, if someone's in a high-risk setting where they think they're probably going to get exposed. So a long-term care facility would be a great example. Someone's immunocompromised or, or extreme elderly, and you're having an outbreak in your facility, Evashield might be something to think about. And which residents are close by, you know, who's, if they're in the same wing or the same pod, um, that might be an opportunity to actually prevent COVID-19. And these monoclonal antibodies are exactly that. They are antibodies, active antibodies that will find the molecule of COVID and, um, and kill it. Um, and so they are uh, authorized by the FDA now as of December 2021 and becoming more widely available. This is one of the newer therapies. Next slide. Paxlovid is probably the big one. Um, this is an oral therapy uh, twice daily for five days, and you can write a prescription for it. It's at Walgreens. It's at CVS. Um, this is the one that we are using in the ED. The monoclonal antibody injections and the Evashield did not prove feasible in terms of, of actually delivering therapy in the ED, just because of bed capacity. And, you know, we have 17 beds in my ED. We're trying to move hundred people a day through 17 beds. And the idea of giving an infusion just really was not feasible. So if in my health system, for example, we, we um, tasked that out to our infusion clinics and then primary care physicians kept um, same day appointments at the end of the day where they could give infusions in clinic. That was our solution to that. And we had to unfortunately decline if people came to ED specifically for um, monoclonal antibodies or infusions. But Paxlovid is easy. You know, we actually have a lot of motor memory with this, um, with influenza. So we, um, Tamiflu is something that we prescribe regularly when someone is high risk for mortality or morbidity from influenza. And it's a pretty similar process. There are a few more uh, contraindications and drug interactions, so you have to do your due diligence, but we will prescribe this from the emergency department and the patient can pick it up in the pharmacy. Next slide. Remdesivir was early on in the, um, in the uh, treatment modalities, and so um, this is a daily IV infusion for three days, so that is a lot of a lot of healthcare interactions for that. That might be good if you're actually in hospital. And that's how I've widely seen it used. If you did have a vulnerable patient and they had a pick line and you had an active medical director who could secure the drug, I could see it being used in a long-term care facility, but I've really seen this mostly um, in a hospital setting. 
when the infusion clinics didn't have enough monoclonal antibody, we were doing remdesivir in the infusion clinics um, and sort of phased that out once the monoclonal antibody became available. Um, and again, if you ask different health systems, you'll get different answers. So when I tell you what we're doing um, in my health system, that is that may well be different in your area. Next slide. Beptelovimab is a single IV injection, another monoclonal antibody inhibitor. Um, and this one proved especially effective against Omicron BA1 and BA2. Um, and so this is kind of a hot one right now. Um, it is emergency use authorization as are most of the monoclonal antibody inhibitors. And I haven't actually seen this one used in our community. It depends on um, you know the, the companies are distributing regional shipments and certain health systems snatch them up. So this is one I have not had the uh, I've not actually seen a patient on before, but it is available. Next slide. This is one we use in my community extensively, so Trovimab. Um, again, single IV infusion. It's a pretty quick infusion too. It's um, 30 minutes to an hour to get it in. And so an infusion clinic, it's a bunch of chairs in a room and you can really get a bunch of people through this. Um, the, the big push was for primary care physicians to be the gateway point for this. Um, and so we have, with our electronic health record, we have a way that the primary care physicians can essentially just take a phone call, set someone up for infusion clinic, and the patient will get a same day appointment as available. We set that up pretty early in, um, in my part of the state, and we were actually getting visitors from up to three hours away. Um, and so it was, it was interesting, you know, to see as these were, um, as, availability of not just drug, but actual spots and infusion clinics was quite low. We were getting tourism for monoclonal antibodies from pretty distant sites. Um, and I think that's really opened up in the month of, month of March, that one month of respite after Omicron um, was essential. Next. Molnupiravir <laughs> is, um, I would say, uh, an alternative uh, to Paxlovid. Uh, it's oral twice daily for five days. And it's just a little bit lower on efficacy and Paxlovid is so widely available. And so, um, and it was kind of the first one on scene that I just haven't seen to get much traction yet, um, but it's a, it's a perfectly good option. And as production ramps up, we may see kind of more competition between those two. Um, but again, this would be a viable option to discharge from in the ED or to have a primary care physician prescribe in a long-term care setting for that reason, for that matter. Next slide. All right, so we've talked about the evidence-based options. Again, in the interest of uh, shoot, shouting down any disinformation, I wanna talk about the non-evidence-based options. So hydrochloroquine, um, that is a chemotherapeutic agent. It is dangerous, it has cardiac side effects. It is ineffective against COVID-19 as, um, as evidenced by multiple studies. And this falls well in the um, territory of malpractice, meaning it is outside the standard of care and could do harm and should not be done. I think you'd be medically legal, legally liable at this point if you were prescribing hydrochloroquine for COVID-19. Um, ivermectin is an anti-worm agent. It's, um, it's used in, mostly in veterinary settings and um, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, equally ineffective against a virus, and again, has side effects, specifically hepatotoxicity or liver toxicity, malpractice. Um, artemisinin is a uh, anti-malarial drug. Um, this, did, this one didn't pick up as much traction in terms of misinformation in the US, um, but globally has gotten a lot of traction um, uh, as, a, as a pseudotherapy for COVID-19. It simply does not work and should not be prescribed. Um, and then steroids early on, it was like everybody was getting steroids was, I'm probably overstating that, but a large proportion of our hospitalized patients were getting steroids and the pendulum really swung too far on that one. They're of limited utility in patients who don't have an underlying condition that would respond to steroids. So if you don't have COPD or you don't have asthma, um, the steroids aren't going to give much additional protection, if any. Um, and so they're not widely recommended. Um, so that one's a little bit different than the first three. It's not misinformation per, per se, but it's a useful therapy that was widely overused early on in the pandemic. Next slide. So you may, you may wonder this. I'm actually, I'm curious in the audience if, if this is something wonderful. What really happens when you get to the ED with COVID-19? Um, and some of these will be applicable to long-term care facility patients, and some of them may not. Like the first one is, is the worried well patient, we say. Um, and so we'll get people who just test positive, and it's knee-jerk reactions. Like they come to ED, what's your chief complaint? Well, I have COVID. I tested positive. They might be asymptomatic. They might have low-level influenza-like illness. Um, 
and certainly no signs of co-infection like productive cough, like a bacterial pneumonia, no high fevers, no hypoxia. Um, those patients we usually send home immediately. Um, if they've done a home test, there's no additional workup whatsoever. It's a physical exam and sort of um, education on, on how to uh, stay hydrated and rest up and stay away from others. Um, or if they have not tested, been tested for COVID-19, we'll usually do a swab, but not wait in the ED for the results. We'll say you're presumed positive, given the same treatment we would someone who's positive, which is supportive care, um, and then discharge them and call them with the results, simply because we don't, didn't have the bandwidth to have people waiting in the ED for results. The next tier up is, is a respiratory workup. So these are people who are working to breathe a little bit. Maybe they have underlying lung illness. Maybe they have a productive cough. Um, you might see um, moderate hypoxia, but not significant. So 95 range for O2 sats or some labored breathing, but um, they haven't exhausted their reserves. They're still comfortable breathing. And these patients get a, a limited workup. So a physical exam and a chest x-ray. Um, certainly discharge home. We wouldn't, even if they had a pneumonia, we wouldn't admit to hospital. Um, and then the, the discharge home is plus or minus antibiotics and steroids, depending on if they have underlying lung disease and if they actually have a secondary bacterial infection, a pneumonia on top of COVID. It's actually pretty rare. It's eight to 10% of patients who have COVID will have a secondary bacterial infection. And it tends to be later in the disease course after five days. Um, so that's not common, um, but it does happen. Now the mega workup. So you see all the, I've got all these labs listed here. They're not, you know, we're not sending a troponin for acute coronary syndrome or myocardial infarction. We're not sending a D-dimer for pulmonary embolism or blood clot in the lungs. These are inflammatory markers that um, for reasons that are not yet fully understood, kind of skyrocket in COVID. Um, and to some extent, the, the elevation of these labs portray, portends whether that patient will um, do poorly or do well. And so they're kind of sent as screening labs for the hospitalist um, if a patient has the potential to come inpatient. But the mega workup is a chest x-ray, a full panel of labs, as you see here, um, and then a likely admit. Uh, and we usually initiate this when patients are hypoxic or working to breathe. So um, to, to gain admission to the hospital, the, the hypoxic level is 88%. Um, and then with COVID, 85% is usually when um, they have a significant oxygen need um, or really increased work of breathing. If somebody's pouring sweat, getting tired, breathing 30 times a minute, grossly abnormal vital signs, that would sort of trigger us to do this mega workup. And we tend to see people decompensate around day 10 with COVID. Um, it's a little bit age dependent. So on the elderly side of the spectrum, that might get bumped up to day six or eight, but people can usually hold their own early on in the disease course. And then they sort of declare themselves around day 10, whether they're going to, you know, persevere and do well and, and fight it off or whether they're going to experience that COVID crash and really go south. Um, and that's when hospital care is important. A lot of people ask to get admitted. It's not uncommon at all. Somebody's 94%, they're dysmic, they feel like crap, you know, they're popping ibuprofen. They say, can you just admit me to the hospital on oxygen? And it's hard as a physician because if you want to admit them, they would probably feel better on oxygen. You know, just having that, having that extra oxygen would, would give them some of their pep back. Um, but it's a, it's a time of precious resources and we don't do it. We can't do it. Um, I'm sure you've all noticed as well that long-term care facility capacity for discharge has been limited as well. So we have facilities around us where they're at half capacity. Um, one facility even closed down entirely. And so to some extent that the hospital has become a nursing home. Um, we have about 35 patients in my hospital right now who have been up there for um, a week longer than they would typically would be just because we're working on placement. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here. I'm sure you're, there's, there's a, a lot of interesting things going on on both sides of that coin. Moving on, the COVID crash. This is COVID-19 positive with really acute respiratory distress or shock vitals. Um, so these, these are people coming crashing and you know they need an intervention you know, an hour ago kind of thing. Um, so they get the same mega workup as above, um, typically an ICU admit, um, and then the degree of airway support is a range. And so intubation would be the most severe. It could be BiPAP, a, a middle ground there. And then high flow nasal cannula has proven um, just extremely effective in getting people out of the ICU. And uh, it's, it's kind of freaked our floor hospitalists and nurses out a little bit, to be honest with you. High flow nasal cannula was usually an intervention that would go to the ICU or the step down unit. And hospitals all across the country, you're seeing patients on high flow nasal cannula on the medical floor. 
Um, and that's another trend that we see is both the ED and the hospital floor are getting used to see, taking care of much sicker patients as we try to preserve ICU capacity. And then the last category is important to know, it's, it's COVID comfort, which is um, someone who's, who's DNR, DNI, or hospice um, and does not have interest in, um, in intubation or BiPAP um, or omega workup. Um, and so obviously that's again on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, one of the thing, things Kelsey asked me is what, what should nursing home directors know about sending patients to ED? Oh my goodness, code status is probably the number one. Um, and if a lot of facilities have really standardized this, but that's usually the first question on my mind when someone comes in and they are working to breathe is what's the code status? Because we, what we don't wanna do is be inhumane. We don't wanna break ribs and go against someone's wishes. Um, and there's even been lawsuits about people who, who were treated as full code when they were not full code, where the physicians were, were sued for resuscitating. That's the, the world we're living in right now. Um, and so clarifying code status is just, um, it's like it's worth its weight in gold for an emergency physician who's, seen, who's meeting someone for the first time in respiratory distress. Um, but these are patients who, if they are in hospice, for example, we can often send home, you know, sometimes with oxygen, if you have a case manager who can facilitate that, um, but at least with some sort of pain control option and, um, and prognostic information. Next slide. So. When people come back to a long-term care facility or nursing home from the ED, that's a call I sometimes get. You know, the, the phone call will be, oh my goodness, I was expecting Mr. Brown to be admitted, but he came back to me, what's going on? And these are reasons people often come back where, where someone had a different expectation. Um, and, and these are truly historic times. I mean, we are, we are having the type of capacity discussions that we are having in the hospital, I have never actually had them before. I've, I've sat down and wrote policies about it and we've theoretically gone there and in ethics courses in medical school, um, but we, we are actually activating our um, crisis standards of care policies and talking about who gets a vent when a vent comes and scoring people based on their illness and what their lab values are and how many organ systems are affected. Um, so this has, never, this has never happened in my career before and it's really happening right now. And um, it is, it's tough to, to digest, honestly. Um, one reason people come back is a successful tune-up. So people will come to the, you know, they'll be on day eight of COVID, they're feeling like crap, we give them some Toradol, we give them some fluids, we rest them on oxygen for an hour, we get a respiratory therapist down, they do an acapella valve and some pulmonary toilet, they clear a bunch of their secretions, patient feels better. That is not an uncommon scenario. And if you, if somebody's not dyspneic and they don't have an oxygen requirement, um, we will send them back off into the world, um, of course, telling them to come back if things worsen. Um, but sort of, it's a temporizing state. And we say, let's give your body a chance to fight off this illness. It might be too early. So some patients are sick, but not sick enough for hospital care. And we don't know who's gonna decompensate and who's not. We can sort of predict if you're you know, frail, elderly, immunocompromised, diabetic, these are risk factors. Um, but plenty of people kind of turn that corner for the good um, and never need hospitalization. So like I said before, the COVID crash comes around day 10 of illness. Um, and we really, we really gotta see hypoxia, significant hypoxia or worker breathing to buy admission to the hospital. Um, infection risk from hospitalization is another reason we'll sometimes send people home. So um, if somebody is, if we, if we have the feeling that the oxygen requirement is not that severe, so maybe somebody's hanging out at 92%, they're a little bit anemic, they've got an acute kidney injury, you could justify hospitalization, but you're looking at the patient ahead of you, in front of you, and they are frail elderly, immunocompromised. The question becomes, is it riskier to bring them into the hospital? Um, and that's a very real question. Hospital acquired infections are on the rise all throughout COVID. It's gotten, you'd think with all the infection control that would be improved. It's not, it's gotten worse. And all of the bad bugs in the tri-county area, all the multi-drug resistant organisms, they come to my building, they live in my building. And that's the question is, is it worth the risk to be hospitalized? So we do scrutinize how, you know, how is this hospitalization gonna benefit the patient? And how is it going to harm them? Um, and that conversation is nuanced. And, and honestly, sometimes it depends on capacity as well. Um, but we're making choices based on, um, on criteria that we haven't always made choices based on. It's a bit of a shift. And then finally, if you're truly in crisis standards of care mode, um, as we were in December, so we had patients in our cafeteria, we had patients in our administration hallways, we were renting beds. Um, sometimes you just simply cannot bring someone into the hospital. You just simply don't have the space. Um, in which case, um, we have risk stratification scores and we'll score people on that. 
And we didn't really have to go into that in earnest too badly. So we were, we, we were definitely shipping people three, four hours away to very distant hospitals. Um, or then we were definitely doing hospital at home where um, we have sort of like a remote monitoring system and you can send someone home, but still get their vital signs. So I, I, we never got to the kind of the scary land where we're choosing who gets a vent and who doesn't, but we were right up against it. Um, and we were there for about two weeks, which is um, very stressful. So, um, so I, I'm hopeful that we're, you know, with the BA2 variant, that it is sort of that silent variants where our, where our inpatient capacity and our ICU capacity gets a little bit of reprieve um, as we clear out the, the backlog of patients who actually need long-term care and are looking for placement. Next slide. All right, so I sort of burned through the information there. Um, and I, I'm not sure how many, how often you get an emergency physician and preventive medicine physician who is ready to give you kind of a candid look at what we do in the ED. Um, I know there are often, um, you know, pain points between transfers in and out of long-term care facilities and ED. I know there are often um, behavioral issues that patients come in with where, where it, there's really a no-win situation. How do we manage these behaviors or where do we go next? Um, and then obviously COVID has thrown um, a lot of curveballs at us in terms of how much sickness can we manage? You know, I'm sure you are all managing a lot more sickness than you're typically used to. And I'm sure your staff are feeling a little bit out of their depth as we are in the emergency department as well. So I just wanted to open it up for questions and a real conversation and, and talk it through. If there's any point at all that you want to talk through, I'm at your disposal. And Kelsey, I see there's a couple things in the chat. I'm going to let you manage the chat and call them out to me if there are questions so I don't have to switch screen and read it all. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you so much, Dr. Redwood. It's always a pleasure listening to you. Share your wealth of knowledge with our team. So really appreciate you being here. At this point, Kim did drop in the chat both the link to the slides for today. So as Dr. Redwood mentioned, um, you have all of this available. Please use it as a resource, as a guide, keep it, save it, whatever you want to do with it. Um, and then the other link, again, is just the um, evaluation for our session today. So at this point, I don't see any question. Oh, I lied. Question just came through in chat. Um, so the question's from Wendy. Are you seeing the new variant causing hospitalization? So uh, short answer, no. We are now 85% um, BA2. And it, it so it hit Germany really hard. Germany was the big country in um, uh, Europe to get hit by BA2. Their map, their darkest color on their map was maroon, and they had to create a new color black, and the entire country was black. So they made our Omicron spike look like nothing compared to their BA2 spike. So that was a big fear in late, in late January that we were going to see that. And even though in general it's causing milder symptoms, if you just have that many cases, some cohort of, that, of those patients are going to be sick enough to require hospitalization, and it becomes a numbers game, kind of like Omicron was. Are we going to overwhelm our hospitals? We're just not seeing that so far. We're not seeing the same spike. And the thought is right now that um, because Om Omicron hit Germany in November and it hit us in January, because BA2 is spreading um, so close to Omicron that we have some sort of hybrid immunity or quasi herd immunity from the recent Omicron spike. Um, so we are kind of cautiously optimistic right now, but 85% of our cases in the US are BA2 and we're not seeing the crazy mega spike that Germany saw right now, but it is about as transmissible as measles. It is mega transmissible. Um, and so time will tell. My hospital right now, we had been at about 115% capacity all through November, all through December, all through January, and we're about 90% capacity right now. So we have beds. There was also another uh, question in chat, in chat, excuse me, in chat from Wendy. Um, are you finding that there it's affecting a certain age group more than others? The the variant, the current variant. Sure, uh, it's affecting the unvaccinated, um, and then within the cohort that's um, affected, uh, certainly the the elderly are going to be more affected than the young. Um, it, you know, it's interesting when when COVID first came out the school shut down. And the conversation about opening up schools became easier when we got more scientific data about how the virus affects children. So um, the virus latches onto these cells called your IL-2 cells. And there are more or there are more of these cells 
in adults than there are in children. And they hang out in your pharynx and your, the back of your throat. And so children just have fewer binding sites for the virus. And then the life cycle of those cells in children is just shorter. So those cells will turn over at a rapid rate in children, and they'll turn over at a slower rate in grownups and, and the elderly. And so the virus also has a shorter amount of time to incubate in children than it does in the elderly. But the real things that determine the extent of your illness are whether you're vaccinated, um, comorbidities like uh, being immunocompromised, diabetes, the usual comorbidities, and then the extent of viral load that you have. So how significant is your exposure? So if you're in, in the house with somebody and you're in close proximity and everybody's unmasked, that is a much, you're, you're, you know, you're going to have a higher viral load than if you kind of pass somebody in passing out on the street. Um, but those are, those are the factors. In general, it does skew towards affecting the elderly more than the young, um, but much bigger risk factors being unvaccinated. This is a, a currently an epidemic of the unvaccinated. These are good questions, keep them coming. Any questions about the ED? We love when you send a MAR. Um, the MAR is so fundamental in terms of just knowing what medications somebody has gotten and, and when they got them. And then it's, this is so funny because you, you I, I know that people give excellent handoffs. So the, the CNA or the nurse gives an excellent handoff to the medics. And then the patient comes there and like the whole thing falls apart. And the medics have been like on the radio and they've got to run somewhere else. So, so I almost, I would almost assume if you don't write it down, we're not going to get an accurate handoff. That is, that has been my reality, especially through this pandemic, as people are like in their hazmat suits, talking through masks and rushing out the door to get to the next case. Um, and so what we always want to know in the ED is what the heck happened? Like why, what was, what was the event that triggered a trip to the emergency department today, whether it was a low O2 sad or, or a syncopal episode, like what actually happened? Um, and then if there's ever any expectations, because sometimes you'll get through the whole visit, you'll, you'll sort of work up what you think was the concern. And then someone said, oh, the concern was actually that they were a fall risk and can't do transfers anymore. And you only discover it at the end of the ED workup. And that, that always feels like you're three steps back. Um, so whenever you have a process that really has clear, crisp communication, preferably written, um, it's so much better than relying on the, and we love our paramedics, don't get me wrong, but relying on that mouth to like, you know, that game of telephone, a lot gets lost in that handoff, unfortunately. Yeah, so I don't see any other questions coming through in the chat just at the moment, but one of the questions I just wanted to kind of spar some conversation with our guests here is, um, what has been your experience with sending patients to the ED having, um, you know, assumed COVID-19? Does anyone have any um, response to any of that? And feel free as always to unmute your lines and share too. I know responding to that is a, a lengthy text response to put in chat. And I apologize, I got distracted by Angie's question in chat. Kristen, she's asking if you could repeat the, the question that you just shared. Yeah, so I'm just asking everyone here um, what your experience has been with in sending patients to the ED that you know may have presumed COVID-19 symptoms. I, I would guess there's been some disappointment, to be honest with you. Um, the level of service that we're able to provide has been different these past six months, um, really two years. And, you know, I know that everybody's caseload is larger from the CNO, CNAs in the nursing home to the nurses in the ED. We're all seeing just more patients. 
and and sicker patients. And so trying to put myself in, in the shoes of a, an LPN or a nurse or CNA at a, at a long-term care facility, who's instead of having a panel of eight, now has a panel of 12, and those patients are more dysmic and their SATs are a little bit lower and they're coughing more frequently, um, that's just a lot of work. And it can be overwhelming. And then you send someone to hospital hoping to get them better, right? To get, the, to get them cared for. And those patients often come right back. They kind of they kind of get a workup, maybe a bit of a tune up, and then come back. And I mean, it's a it's a round robin challenge, just trying to trying to manage this epidemic um, as patients. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Angie. Um, she commented again that she said uh, we are not we have not sent residents until confirmed, and more treatment is needed than we can provide. Also, we have sent residents in for treatment, and they return. So. I guess my next question to all of you then is, what are you seeing for the transition of care that you're experiencing with the discharges from the hospitals back to your nursing home? And are you feeling like you're able to maintain that level of care? And Angie commented, thank you. Um, we have had only a few cases, but the transitions have been good. We only had one resident actually admitted for care. Uh, Wendy has commented to us, I think we always have very good communication with the ED. Which I think is awesome. And Wendy, I don't know if you're in a spot where you can unmute your phone and share a little bit more about that, but. Dr. Redwood, as you were talking and sharing from your standpoint, you know, some of the things that you love when, you know, residents are admitted or come to the ED, um, you know, some of those things that they come with, right? So whether that's written documentation, what that handoff communication looks like. Um, so Wendy, I would be curious from your standpoint, like what does this process look like? Um, and are there things within that process that you feel have been really impactful or helpful for you? Can you hear me? Sure can. Okay. Okay. So we're in a small uh, rural area of about maybe 5,000 people. So there's just one ED and we have the EPIC system. So uh, the nurses at the nursing home here all have access to that. So it's very easy to kind of communicate that way and see what they're putting in, what labs are being drawn. So the all the paperwork goes, but then there's really good communication back and forth. So we haven't had any um, adverse events other than people sometimes are in the ED a long time, but with all those tests they have to do, that's, you know, understandable. And that can be very beneficial having that shared communication of systems so that you're not just sitting and waiting for some of that information to come back to you via however it is um, being faxed over to your nursing home from the ED or after an admit as well. Um, another question I wanted to ask each of you is um, how you feel your vaccinations are going within the nursing home, whether it be staff or residents, and if you feel there's a need to help organize any sort of vaccine clinics so that you aren't seeing as many people have symptoms or contract uh, COVID. This is Wendy again. We had um, a couple of vaccine clinics here, but we have approximately um, about, we just checked this morning, almost 300 people that haven't gotten the booster. So they're not considered up to date. So we have to do that additional testing. They're all good with getting the first two vaccines. Some got the booster, but a lot of them now are not believing anything. You know, they see people that get get it with the booster and without, so they don't want to get it. I don't know if anyone else has those same problems. Yeah, that's an excellent question, Wendy. So are there any others in attendance today that are seeing that similar trend? And 
Angie in our chat said residents are excellent staff. The hesitancy continues even more so with boosters. We have 90% of staff vaccinated, but only 55% boosted. We have held internal clinics, educated, encouraged, et cetera. Stacy saying that, yes, the same thing here is what Wendy is referring to. Dr. Redwood, actually, I am curious now, you're on the, I want to just say on the other side of, of the nursing home in regards to hospitals. So are you struggling in regards to the staff too in hospitals? Um, are they um, uh, more receptive to the booster? And if they are, was there something that uh, the hospital or yourself promotes to increase uh, the booster rate with your staff that you work with? That's a great question. Thank you. Um, we, uh, so initially there was widespread adoption among the um, providers. So NPs, PAs, and physicians, we were at about um, 98%. Um, and then among nurses, it was low. It was um, somewhere around 70%. And, um, and I think only around 30% for pregnant nurses. Um, so we had a big gap there, particularly among our nursing staff. Our system did make it mandatory. So, um, so uh, vaccines and boosters, and, um, and you got fired. You got fired if you didn't get them. Uh, and people essentially um, got it. Uh, and then the, those who did, there, you know, there were a few people who there were no religious exemptions. Um, because no, no major churches have actually said that they're against the vaccine. People were sort of saying it was a religious exemption, and then you'd go and look in the Catholic Church website, and they'd say, no, but this is not against our religion. Um, and so um, when those people did leave, the staff who remained on actually reported feeling so much safer and feeling grateful that the, um, that the system took a hard stance on that. So that was politically unpopular at the time and wasn't a big deal. Actually, it, it was it went quite smoothly, and so we are we are a hundred percent vaccinated unless someone has an actual medical reason like anaphylaxis. That's the one exemption that still remains. It did have to be a top down decision. So, and Dr. Redwood, from a provider standpoint, are you seeing any differences with the BA two? You know, reflecting on Omicron, obviously we know people that got boosted still got infected. But we know that the whole point of the vaccine isn't to prevent illness. It's to reduce severity, duration, those sort of things. So in light of people who are up to date, again, including that booster, what are you seeing for people presenting to the ED or are you seeing that at all? We, so um, are, you are you talking about among staff? Uh, no, uh, patients that are presenting to the ED. Are they fully, I guess, up to date, including that booster or what you're seeing now is people that are less than. Well, we, we always have selection bias. So the people presenting to the ED tend to be the unvaccinated, um, but that's because they get sicker enough to come to the ED because they're unvaccinated. So I would say that um, as we've gone through wave after wave, we are seeing more unvaccinated um, because with the earlier, um, the, the earlier waves, there were issues with um, vaccine scarcity and now the real issue is vaccine hesitancy. Um, and so we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll see people who, unfortunately, even after getting illness, don't wanna, don't wanna get vaccinated. Um, and then among staff, I hope I'm answering your question cor correctly. And then among staff, um, the, you know, the return to work policies have really drastically shortened um, with the new variants and with people being vaccinated and boosted. So most people can come back to work about three days after they test positive, um, as long as they're symptom free which has been instrumental, trying to, trying to staff an ED when people were out for, because like all of you, we had no margins, right? We were staffed to exactly the number of hours we had to staff per year. So somebody's out for two weeks and you're screwed. Um, and so now we're, it's been much easier to keep the place staffed, but we, we actually had our primary care physicians trained in the ED um, as emergency providers were out for two weeks sick, um, or not even sick, but just having tested positive and we'd have our PCPs step in and take ED shifts. I have a couple comments in the chat. Uh, first one from Angie saying, the fact that so many vaccinated and even up to date did get Omicron, it was really difficult to continue to encourage the vaccines and boosters. It remains so. Even though we have educated about the benefits of reduced risk of serious illness, hospitalization and death. Um, any thought on that, Dr. Redwood? Could you repeat it? I'm sorry. Um, 
that even that the fact that so many vaccinated and up to date did get Omicron, it was really difficult to continue and encourage the vaccines and boosters. And it remains as so. And even though they've educated about the benefits of the reduced risk of serious illness, hospitalization and death. Sure. I mean, there are, there will be vaccine failures. And I mean, we, we see this all the time with the flu vaccine. Oh, I, I, um, you know, I got the vaccine and I got the flu and, um, and that, you know, I think as, as educated healthcare professionals, we're pretty used to two-step logic where we can, where we can say, well, you got the flu, flu, but it could have been much worse if you hadn't been protected against that. Um, and that's, that's a pretty hard concept to convey, especially when you have concrete linear thinking people who are just sort of like, you know, the vaccine should prevent this. And there's, there's a lot of nuance there. So, uh, I don't know. I mean, I guess with my individual patients, I just sort of read the patients and, um, and see, you know, in, in medicine, we talk about a stages of change model where you see how likely are they to accept it. So if somebody's just like, you know, dead set against it, I'm not getting that. That's a really hard starting point to get through. I'm, I, and I don't really think I'm going to be able to get there in an ED visit. And I might not even go there. I might maybe email their PCP and see if they can work on them or something like that. Um, if somebody is pre-contemplative, like they say, oh, can you imagine a world where you would get the vaccine? And then you sort of ask probing questions. If it were 100% effective, would you get it? What if it were 95% effective? What if 19 out of 20 times it would protect you? Well, what if it was 80% effective? And you can kind of walk them down the scale. That might be a way to sort of convey that, um, that there is like a gray area there and it's still possible to have a vaccine failure um, or, or really a vaccine success, right? You might still get the illness, but get milder illness. Well, what if, you know, what if it prevented you from getting intubated? What if it prevented you from dying? Um, and sort of walk them down that spectrum of disease and see if you can get through to them that way. But it's not easy. I, I feel your pain. And then Kelly asked if you could repeat about the three-day return part. Where did this come from? Oh, sure. So we're part of the Mass General Brigham system. We're a 13 hospital integrated healthcare system and everything comes top down. Um, so we have an infection control policy that um, I would, it changes like the weather, it changes every week, but it, the general trend has been towards sooner return to work. And in its current iteration, if you test positive for COVID, um, but you are um, symptom free, so asymptomatic, you can return to work um, masked in three days. And the thought is that your viral load is, is so low by that time that your transmiss transmissibility is really negligible. Um, and yeah, they're evidence-based guidelines. And um, when you, when you want to care for an epidemic, you have to keep your workforce at work. And so the idea is you've got all these people who are asymptomatic. They actually want to be going to work. They don't want to be at home, um, but they tested positive. And what is the safest way to get them back to work? If you have symptoms, it's still longer. I'd be happy to share kind of the one pager on that if you want me, Kelsey, if you want me to email that out. It's just, it's just one health system. Everybody's got to have their own policy, but, um, but it's, I would say it's pretty progressive and evidence-based. Absolutely. If you don't mind sharing that, we can make sure it gets to this group. Sure. And I know myself, uh, prior to working here, I was in a clinic as a nurse and it was the same type of policy where if you were asymptomatic and, you, you know, had been those few days, it might've been, I can't remember exactly, but I think it was asymptomatic, maybe three days or so. Um, it was just return with a N95 and a surgical mask over and back to work. <laughs> Does anyone else have any questions that you'd like to pose for Dr. Redwood while we still have him? All right, well, hearing none, Kristen, thank you so much for moderating our Q&A today. Dr. Redwood, thanks again so much for being here. And for all of our participants, thank you for your engagement, for your questions, for just being willing to share and, and you know, have this conversation. Um, we will wrap up our session for today. Thanks for hanging with us for the full hour. As a reminder, the slides and the evaluation for our session are in chat, so feel free to grab those before you log off. Um, otherwise, wishing you a great week. We will be back next week, same time, same 
date, place, we're here. Um, and we look forward to connecting with you all next week. Such a pleasure. Thank you, everyone.